Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocates, where we confront issues of truth and the way forward. Heads on, no hold bar. Emeka connects remotely and is taking stock of the deadly cost of incompetence and I'm sure it will be a pricey one. Ekene is also calling a spade a spade. She says we all need to take responsibility for the increasing numbers of motherless baby. And with the lockdown, definitely the numbers will be more. David Hondei, a fresh face, but a veteran to advocacy, will be proving that the pen is mightier than the sword as he frames a debate on which he says, all our futures hinges on. I wait to hear that. I'll be laying down the gauntlet by saying, I won't want peace, but equal right and justice. And I'll be saying much more after the break. According to the great song of late reggae artist Peter Tosh, everyone is crying out for peace here. Yeah. None is crying out for justice. I don't want no peace but equal rights and justice. Reverse of wickedness is my topic today. Before I begin, please permit me to salute some of our latest emperors in Nigeria for making our society a laughing stock. I salute our Supreme Court for not allowing a big man like Ojuz or Kalu to stay for too long in prison by asking the Federal High Court to start his trial fresh on grounds of technicalities. Some people might have to turn to Ogu, Uchi, Alika, and Amadioha to get justice soon. As lawyers, we should be concerned. What's the guarantee that the next trial judge will not be elevated, transferred, or retired before delivering judgment after 12 years of trial? Might be mini jam questions, that's the way they say it in Yoruba. I salute our emperor ancestors, former head of state, General Sani Abacha, for always coming to our aid with huge cash anytime we seem broke. As barely a week after helping to repatriate $311 million, that's about 118 billion naira stolen by the late head of state, the United States says there's a separate $319 million, that's about 121 billion naira, a batch of loot in the United Kingdom and France. How come we're not bothered about looking for people who helped a batch take out this fund? Or maybe they are busy helping others take out more fund presently. But they should remember, like a batch, they might just be sending the country money from the graveyard. I also want to salute Governor Erufai of Kaduna for looking the other way when Fulani bandits descended on a town called Gonan Rogo and Meyaki of Edom Ward of Kajare local government of the state, even after SOS was sent by inhabitants and their representatives. With killings like this, I think this is a wake up call also for us to begin to discuss state policing once again and a proper federal structure. Now, I want to salute Emperor Wiki. Oh, sorry, Governor Wiki of River State for his outrageous display of irresponsibility in being the lawmaker, prosecutor, judge, and executor in the demolition of two hotels in Port Harcourt, an indiscriminate arrest of people and vehicles for violating his executive order regulation in River State, even though he also subsequently violated the order in the meeting he had in a hotel with his party members. A 24 hours coffee imposed on Port Harcourt without palliative and opportunity to access food and medical facilities. Despite the fact that statistics have shown that 66% of new cases in New York are those who have been indoors without any history of contact with the first dead person. I think this is the time for us to begin to take outside the box to solve this pandemic. Why is one cannot query the governor for locking down the state to curb the spread of the virus? Because lockdown actually worked. After all, the federal government tried the same approach in Lagos, Ogun, and Abuja until they realized the unsustainability of full impact of a continued lockdown. But the condemnable, uncivilized, and obnoxious way and manner the governor went about the enforcement of the lockdown calls to question once again the attitude and mentality of our ruler in the way they see themselves and us. Is it the demolition of our fellow's property in Ibadan by the then constituted authority, governor of your state, Abiola Ajimobi, 
or the demolition of Olusola Saraki's house in Elori by the current governor of Kwara State? How about Erufai's demolition of houses of opposition in Kaduna before and after the 2019 election? Not to talk of the recent demolition of hotel known to a political opponent in Benin by the obaseki led administration. The list is endless. No matter the offense committed, the governor could have sealed up the place and allowed the owners to have their day in court by prosecuting them. Because it is a notorious fact that executive orders, including the ones recently made by the president, no matter how well intended, cannot take the place of a valid law, not to talk of the violation of a fundamental right, without recourse to the provisions of the constitution as to fair hearing. It's unfortunate how some of us, out of sheer politics, endorse tyranny of government and turn around to complain when it affects us or someone close to us. How on earth can someone with his right senses be endorsing the wickedness we can visit on the owners of this hotel? Well, like Fast says, this is Nigeria. Assuming but without conceding that the governor's executive orders are law validly made, it will still take the court to properly adjudicate and pronounce the commission of an offense, portion to same, and appropriate penalties apportioned. It is not the place of the governor to make a law, execute and adjudicate on same, as that would amount to concentrating too much power in one arm of government. And as we all know, absolute power, they say, corrupt, you be the judge of that. My advocacy today would be borrowed from the words of his lordship, Bill Bailey Abraham Judge Will, a, judge of, a river state bond judge of the Court of Appeal, in his concurring judgment in the case of Fedo Kafo and governor of Lagos State, with similar facts. According to the learned jurist, Democracy thrives more on obeying and promoting the rule of law rather than the whims and caprices of the leader against the lead. We as citizens should refuse a situation where someone is put through the rigors of the criminal process for an offense not prescribed in any written law, but merely on the directive of his governor of his state. An action which, if allowed to thrive in a democracy such as ours, could confer on such office holder infinite, absolute, and autocratic powers, contrary to the clear provisions of the constitution of the land to which both the leaders and the led are subject. For if we all refuse to allow such autocratic, absolute, and infinite power to fester, ours will be a beautiful democratic society to behold. What comes to mind immediately, or towards the end when you were you're reading, I made notes, so I'll probably reference my notes unless uh, David wants to jump in. But um, what came to mind is the look before you leap, you know, because I was listening to the radio and some people, a good amount of people actually, were defending Wiki. And I was surprised because I said, what they, their argument was, oh, that we need this kind of strong arming, that Nigerians, unless you treat us like this, we won't obey the law. Right. So I'm like, you think so little of yourselves. But you're, you're, for now, it serves you right. You, you're happy for him to behave like this. Tomorrow, if you're on the receiving end of that kind of treatment, then you'll understand exactly. that this is wrong. So what you're defending and what I'll always forever defend is checks and balances because we already have more than enough evidence that our leaders abuse it. Even when the things are even right in themselves, they still abuse it. How much more when you now leave a loophole for them to really go to town? I mean, Wiki's body language, everything he's doing, makes it just reeks of the kind of thing you don't need in this day and age. You know, so I'm, I'm even surprised that the federal government are letting him run riot like this. I'm not sure what they're afraid of. You know, so um, the issue, I just want to quickly contextualize the issue of the 66%. I know it was said in passing uh, in, in New York, because that really, I think uh, the governor of New York accepted that lockdown works to that extent, but he did appreciate that. He was just pointing out a lot of them were minorities, and some of them, yes, they were at home, but the odd person would go and come back. So it was almost like they're bringing the infection to the home, and then everybody is circulating it. So no one is saying, and I, I, I'm at pains to say this, that lockdown doesn't work, because it does. But it's whether it will be implemented well enough for it to have the uh, desired effect. And then um, I like the fact that you chronicle offenders without any bias, because when you start looking at those who have demolished houses, you go through the list. So it's not like you're trying to just target one person. This is something that has a precedent. And for some reason, people have let them get away with it, which is where I'm pained. Why do you let people get away with it? You, know, you made a point the other day, which I heard you say, look, why are you now taking the man to court when you've already taken yeah. justice? You know, you've, already ex you've already executed justice upon him. If anything, you owe him compensation. What if the courts then say you are wrong? Will you go and restore that building back to the way it was? So all of it is a bit backward. Um, I, I have other things to say, but let me stop there. <laughs> it's, it's funny you mentioned the, the fact of him acting without the support of the law. Because if you actually read the executive order that he put out, and I, I did a story on this a few days ago, he actually flouted his own executive order. Oh, really? Executive order said that the prescribed penalty for flouting the lockdown order was seizure and expropriation of the property. It did not mention demolition. Demolition. So this guy literally just made it up as he was going along. Oh, wow. So, um, the issue I was trying to raise in the story that I did was if a governor in Nigeria, because we, we know that the Land Use Act 
is a fairly problematic piece of legislation. It was promulgated under a military government, obviously. Okay. And, and we have modified it. Yes. It vests all the land in a state in the governor. Wow. So technically, no one, the only reason we, do, we, we don't have more of an issue with this is that for whatever reason, the governors in Nigeria have not really abused that power I'm surprised yet. to hear that. <laughs> but with actions like this now, I think it's starting to become more and more apparent that what powers do governors in Nigeria actually have access to? So what aspects of the Land Use Act gives them authority to demolish houses? So I'm not so sure that he has the authority to, to demolish the house as such, mm. but technically, no one in Nigeria actually owns property. The, owned the, governor, the governor holds the property in trust for the people. It's like the feudal it's a system trustee. in the UK. Yeah. Yes, it's a trustee. And, and that's why what the governor gives is a certificate of occupancy for you to occupy oh. for a period no of ownership. years. Yeah. For a period of years. And the constitution also you know, allows you to own movable and immovable properties. Okay. So for that period that you are in occupation, you are in possession, mm. you own that property okay. by the law. Mm. And, and so and if, if, the government, if the government heirs. must revoke, mm. it must have to be for overriding public interest. Mm. Overriding public interest must be clearly spelled out. Before they take that right away before, from you. And then you must also be notified within a reasonable time so that you can approach the court before that right will be taken away from you. So you say you own it for a number of years. What happens when that number, years. after 99 years, you have to renew it? Yes, it reverts back okay, to government. It's like the British system. Okay. And then you renew. Yeah. And so within that 99 years, you can transfer your interest to anybody with the consent of the governor. Okay. You, you know, so it's pretty simple. But what we have are situations where the governors just, for some reasons or no reasons at all, will demolish a property, even when the matter is in court, mm. and they claim overriding public and interest. And no court has taken them And at them the to... end of, in most cases, there are damages, but these damages are not paid from their pocket. This is from the state coffers, from the taxpayers. So no lesson is learned. Exactly. Mm. Emek, are you joining us on this? Are you there? I, 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 I mean, uh, for me, I think um, Libero has touched on this. Um, I think it's a foundational problem. What, what I mean is, it's a fundamental problem. So we're living... We've been living under this climate of arbitrariness uh, since uh, the military regime. And um, so power rests, you know, we see this thing purely from a prism of power. Um, so who has power can utilize that power in any way they deem fit. And they can always claim it's, it's in the public interest. And also we, um, as, as followers, as citizens, um, having suffered under this, arbitrariness for so long, uh, we, we kind of like accept it, uh, which is why you hear people um, saying, oh, people deserve it, um, you know, until it's them um, yes. that, that, that it affects. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's a big problem. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure um, that we have tested some of the provisions um, in, in law, in, in courts. I think that, um, you know, like David said, this issue of... Um, of uh, the Land Use Act. Uh, that's something that I think that any serious government, uh, maybe in the next election, should really, really look at in, in mm. terms of how do you reform that particular piece yeah. of legislation? Yeah. Because it's something that, um, you know, I mean, you can't, you know, we talk about capital, raising capital. When land doesn't belong to you, which is a fundamental um, aspect of raising, uh, of, of development, yeah. is yeah. capital. Yeah. Um, so when that is clearly at the whims and caprices of one man, uh, then there's, then we have a problem. I think I mean, that the, that... The, the so, other, sorry, I was just going to say Yeah, that. go ahead. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I, what I want to applaud, though, is because I'm beginning to see that the vision of the future looks like name and shame might be our, uh, do you say, public court, you know, way of... Because his, his advocacy is like sarcastic, but in a way, it might be the only thing that gets to them. Because I noticed that as much as Mickey was trying to act like sticks and stones may break my bones, when the public started crying out against him, he started beating a retreat. So that may be the only you know, weapon we have against people who are so thick-skinned and they're operating as if they have a tanker or whatever, armory around themselves. So you know, again, I have to commend your advocacy. I feel you really landed a, a proper punch right where it deserved to be landed. Thank you. Thank mm. you. I, and I think... Uh, uh, we uh, need is it possible to say one last thing? Because yes, I just please. Saw, uh, yeah, I just saw a news report of, of in River State where the PDP people had, a, had an event um, was it yesterday or day before yesterday where there was no social distancing, social distancing you know, at that event. 
Um, I expect we could so, go and destroy the hotel also. And he was there as well. Oh, and okay. The governor was See there the hypocrisy. as well. So you know, I mean, it, it's just that was you know, do you pick and choose? You pick and choose which law or that, was, uh, that you choose to you know enforce. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's. You laughing, remember, I laughing. talked about Fuka Kidele yeah. and then the legal yeah. the attorney general last week. Yeah. It is the same thing with Wiki here. And, and anyway, I think you always run that risk when you're being draconian that you're going to end yeah, up exactly, falling, exactly. falling by the same Precisely. rule that you're, yeah. Yeah, you're pushing yeah. against. Anyway, from what we gather, it's a bribe gone, sir. But we'll talk about that some other time. Well, mm -hmm. um, this is uh, the most that time can permit us on this segment. Saying it like it is, is the one option left to us when faced with serious odds. Emeka certainly set out to do this after the break. Go on, Emeka. So this week, I'm going to be talking about the deadly cost of incompetence and compromise, um, which is really basically where we are in this country. Um, it was Lance Morrow, the Pulitzer Award winning journalist, uh, American journalist who wrote in Time magazine an article, um, I think it was just after the June 12th crisis, that Nigeria then, as now, um, is ever standing on the precipice. And yet somehow, each time, we manage to keep just you know, moving along. In his words, um, Nigeria is a country where the worst never happens and the best is impossible. Um, so clearly, Nigeria is a country born of the, what I consider the lowest form of compromise um, designed to serve the interests of beneficiaries that are not the citizens of Nigeria. And, 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 and that's what we'll find every day. And so over the years, all our systems are driven from this wheel of compromise and never competence from education, security, agriculture, to even our national politics. It's indeed the politics of mediocrity that drives most of the choices we make as a nation, especially political power, when it comes to political power. It's always not the best woman or man for the job. It's often the, that person who is less threatening, even if less qualified. In fact, more, less qualified. It's what they will often choose, more able to obey. So. You wonder why Nigeria, which has produced some of the best and the brightest in any field of endeavor, still cannot produce enough electricity for its people. I think the answer lies squarely in the politics of compromise and incompetence, which we have elevated to a high art. And for those who remember in Lagos, why should Lagos have badges to generate electricity? And so let's frustrate Lagos or force them to share power to other parts of the country. Why should there be a working free port zone in Calabar? when other regions don't have. So we have a situation where even if we have enough resources to build a one world-class hospital in Benin City, for, for example, in the current spot of compromise, the question would then be, what happens to other zones? So let's frustrate Benin and make sure we share the money equally and eventually nothing gets built anywhere. So instead of building competence, we elevate a sickening quota system of compromises. Today, as countries far less qualified or equipped with resources are finding ways of dealing with this um, corona pandemic, we're busy making excuses for our incompetence, which is now killing Nigerians. Senegal, for example, has shown us how serious a country should deal with, with the pandemic, using skills and resources of its people to build testing kit, treatment centers, and today the country is reporting more people tested, the lowest number of deaths and infections compared to Nigeria, even Ghana has tested over 100,000 people and has announced plans to build 80 new hospitals in towns and villages without one. But in dealing with our national security, we also resort to compromise and indeed elevate regime loyalty. And today we are witnesses to the consequences of the choices we make and hold dear. The fear that I have for our country, Nigeria, is that eventually, it is Nigeria that will kill more people than COVID-19 through compromise and incompetence. And this incompetence rises from the decisions we make daily. That is the real enemy. The real enemy is incompetence and compromises. We should squarely take aim at this and find ways of dealing with this culture of chronism and so that we can get our country moving back to, to, to the path of development and growth. That's it, guys. Thank you. Um, for me, um, spot on, spot on advocacy and um, um, the way out of, of all of this, because you find that out when you clamor for the youth to take the center stage, um, there are no mentorship. Okay. And, and so the only thing they see out there, you know, the majority of them see, you know, are the mentors that they see in music, okay. in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. 
and so no political mentorship. And so when they now, when you clamor for you to take the center stage, they pick out the worst of worst amongst you, mm. and then you know use that as um, you know template. A, a template. <laughs> and so all of you now will be pointing at that one as, oh, is that man not a youth? Is he not a youth? So after all, you ask for youth. Yeah, he is, but yet he's not um, competent. Rather, we should be asking. This is not the best of the youth that you could get. So why bring this worst one? Mm. We have better and brighter youths. You know, it's the same thing, you know, in all facets. You, the first thing we ask for, where is he from? What religion does he practice? Rather than, you know, is he competent to do the job? Those are, are basically, you know, and now our political leaders know these things. So they divide us along that line. Why is it that when they are together, when they're going, is, um, is good, they don't quarrel. They will be it APC, PDP, EDC, CPC, all of them, mm -hmm. they don't quarrel. When it is time to share a common patrimony, they are all united. How come when you talk about, oh, a section of this country have been so marginalized, yet this section of the country have leaders who are also representing them at the center, and these people are not complaining, but the day they get kicked out of the sharing pots. Mm. That's when they now begin to they complain. Remember. They say, our people. So they drag us along. So we should, my, for my, my, my advocacy is, we should understand that, you know, all of these people are not with us. So once we see the truth, the only way, if you see incompetence, fighting competence, irrespective of who is involved, mm. not because, oh, your brother is there, whether he's competent or not, is anyway, he's there, mm. let him just remain there. I mean, uh, coming in on that, because I, I know uh, I, I could hear you agreeing with him, is to say, I always try to say, okay, what precedes the attitude? Because attitude doesn't just materialize by itself. You know, why is it that we have it in abundance in Nigeria? And I feel that to before you start adopting an attitude where you rather subscribe to compromise and incompetence, you must have believed a lie. You know, somewhere along the line, because I even see it on smaller organizations, forget politics. You see where instead of a people building together, they think that their enemy is their, you know, colleague or whoever, and you start pulling in di different directions, you're all going to lose out. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. So somewhere in, in the, our psyche, we've believed a lie. And, we, and this belief of a lie doesn't start with the politicians. It's something that's recycled on a daily basis. It's now a cultural thing. If you go on social media, you see how people trade words based on I don't know, they just they prefer to be angry with the other person based on some sort of vagueness. Oh, your Igbo, oh, your Yoruba, your Hausa. You don't even know what the person really believes. So I, somehow we really believe that lie. It's like a poison in our souls. And so I agree with you, Emeka, but I would target my enemy at that lie, that lie that somehow divided is the way forward. We need to understand that I, we have more in common I, with I the think, man, I think, your brother, than you have you know, that separates I you. Think, I, I agree. I, I, can, I, can, can I say something here? Yeah. Um, sorry to, to cut in briefly. Uh, this is a very short advocacy, but I think it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this advocacy. It's, it's really how, in my view, how the country was set up ab initio. It was set up based on a foundation of, um, of compromise. I mean, I mean, you know, so it wasn't set up to, to pr produce the best in us. Always. But it we, was could, set we, up can to take, take, we can take responsibility henceforth. We can't keep blaming uh, uh, our foundation. I mean, uh, until you, you fix know, you it. And we talked about this on this show several I, times, I, I think, uh, about, about restructuring, America, about America setting the country us, on the right path. Chew on this. If I, David, come in okay. before we, we yeah. slaughter it. <laughs> what are your thoughts? I mean, so personally, I think a, a big part of the reason, and a lot of the time when I have conversations on, on these issues, I always, I always end up going toward childhood. And there's a reason for that. The way, the things we are raised to believe in Nigeria are kind of a foundational problem okay. that at some point we're going to have to take a look at. We, I mean, I can speak for myself. Okay. The first time in, in my life that I saw that I had words, like I spoke to someone who was a Muslim, I think I was about seven years old. For the first seven years of my life, I don't think I'd ever met a Muslim. You know, and. I had a very, you know, the idea that was fair to me was that they had horns going out of their heads or oh, something, wow. you know. They were not good people. And then I remember I had a classmate, his name was Laulu, and he became a really good friend of mine. And he was a Muslim. You know, and it wasn't like, you know, oh, there's a big deal about him being a Muslim. Then I realized that, oh, he's just like me. It's just that he happens to go to this place called a mosque. So, but that division that was but fair why, to me. Uh, I'm assuming your parents fed it. Why did they feed it to you? Because it has to start from somewhere. Again. So I don't know if you heard of something called the uh, five five monkeys experiment, okay. where basically I think I have. 
Yeah, so uh, the story behind the experiment is that someone puts five monkeys into a cage, yeah. puts a banana yes, at, yes. on a raised platform, and then, um, and then any monkeys, stories pass down yeah, from exactly. generation to generation. So basically, all the five monkeys eventually are replaced, and none of the new five monkeys knows why they are still beating up. Only the same up. story of, um, but they of, keep on repeating that. So they are guarding a slab for more than thirty yes, years. Yes, I heard they, that one. So, so how do we reverse but, but, it? But then? the thing is, because I grew up in a in an environment where you have Muslims and Christians, mm. I can recite the Fatiha. I've recited the fat, Fatiha on this program before, and then um, I I read some part of the Quran. It wasn't a big deal. Those days, those of us that grew up. You know, where there's Salah celebration, we celebrate together. Where there's Christmas, we celebrate together. We still, you know, the problem is, like Emeka said, a faulty foundation. Okay. When Boko Haram started, people who understood that Boko Haram was not Islamic, rather than them to come out and push the message that this is not an Islamic thing, they all kept silent and maintained a conspiracy of silence because it favored them at that time. Okay. And, and so for those who didn't know, said, well, this is an Islamic thing. And then that election also, rather than us pushing the right narrative, because we want to win election at, at all costs, and there are no rules. Exactly. Even where there are rules, they are observing breach. Exactly. You find out that at the end of the day, these rules are jettisoned completely. And so people now soak in what they hear, you know, during this period. That, that's basically it. Well, I guess the essence of Emeka's message is shine your eye, you. No point walking blindly towards a cliff. Interestingly, my message has a similar moral after the break. I'll tell you more. Taking responsibility is a necessary first step to turning over a new leaf. I'm going to be talking about how Nigeria is producing motherless babies. There is a term that has become increasingly commonplace during this period of the global fight against the pandemic. And no, it's not social distancing, but taking responsibility. It is in light of this that I want to make a bold assertion. Nigeria is producing motherless babies. And by Nigeria, I mean every one of us that make up Nigerian society. My sister recently shared an article with me that recounted how a desperate Nigerian girl ended up selling her baby boy rather than return home pregnant to face the music of shame and possible disownment. Note that this was after she was advised that an abortion would be both dangerous for her and the baby. It is a real tragedy when a society functions in such a way that it creates a culture that consistently puts people between a rock and a hard place. The layered betrayals that make up this tragedy of that young girl's story are notably the male counterpart or exploiter for impregnating and abandoning her, her parents for instilling in her a greater sense of fear than love, extended family members and the larger community for constructing a narrative of stigma and condemnation rather than redemption. Government for not providing or supporting organizations that give such people a way of escape but rather forces them to make the less than upright choice. From the baby traders who run the baby factories to the respectable couples who are ready to buy these babies on the black market, all, as far as I'm concerned, are culpable. We're not even speaking of the constant presence of poverty in the land that makes options like baby factories part of the demand and supply chain. An article written by the Vanguard in 2016 states that record number of baby factories were raided or closed down in the southeastern states of Abia, Anambra, Eboi, Enugu, and Imo that year, according to NAPTIP. It states that recorded data showed that a total of 14 were discovered in the first nine months of 2016, up from six in 2015, and 10 in 2014. There are also more recent data. We're also told that newborns were sold for up to $5,000, whereas the mothers of the babies were given as little as 20,000 Naira or 50,000 Naira. I have previously heard stories of young girls who find themselves pregnant after suffering the trauma of rape, only to be abandoned by their family and ostracized by society. But for the odd good Samaritan, many of these young ladies are suicidal, and I shudder to think of the avenues their limited options have led them to. You and I must cease to look the other way in these matters. We must rather seize the opportunities we come across to share compassion when we meet people who are essentially victims of their society. We, 
are that society. And it is we who can change the narrative by any means necessary. It's time we all took responsibility. Yeah, uh, taking responsibility, first and foremost, um, the welf security and welfare of the people you know, is the government's responsibility. And um, in ensuring that security and welfare, um, if you break it down a bit further, there's need for proper education, orientation, and sanctions. But when all of these are failing in society, you, you know, it becomes a lawless one. And I always say it, in a state of lawlessness, it is illegal to be law-abiding. We ought to. Um, Dr. Uh, Helen Paul came out to say that she's a product of okay. rape. And today she's a proud PhD holder and she's um, a model. She's everything rolled into one. Mm. How come we are not using her? I did an advocacy on her once here. Mm -hmm. How come we're not using her to tell a story? How come government is not using her to, you know, push this narrative that, you know, you can't, sometimes some of these things happen, but you shouldn't throw away the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Literally. You have religion and cultural beliefs also that nobody is questioning. And so the more you push this religious belief and cultural beliefs, you know, the more you create fear in the mind of these young people. And with even the couples know, who are adopting, adopting through the black market. Yes, through the black market. Mm -hmm. because, because there's a stigma that some, they don't have their some, own child. Yes, that they don't have their own child. Mm. And then government processes also are very cumbersome and you know, so until government sit down and look at this area and say, mm. Oh, this is a menace, this is a big menace that is waiting to explode in our face, and we need to take responsibility and check it. We will just talk and at the end of the day, someday, some of these people will be involved and then it will be too late to actually checkmate at that time. So my, my own angle specifically is with regards to what you mentioned about the fact that some of these ladies actually can't go home. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. after whatever, you know, whether they got, whether it was consensual or not, mm -hmm. and if they get pregnant and they can't go home. For me, this speaks to one of the biggest issues that I have with the current constitution of Nigeria. Okay. As I'm sure you're aware, the rights that women have access to in Nigeria are significantly fewer than those that men have access to. So, for example, uh, if, I'm not, if I remember correctly, a married woman is not allowed to apply for a passport on her own without her husband. Okay, Jean, I'm not even aware of that. Yes, so there are lots of these issues. So, the, where I'm going with this is that this is, this <laughs> is a society where both culturally and legally, a woman is less of a person. Mm. Than a man, and where that is a problem is that where a woman ends up pregnant in a situation where she's out of wedlock, or, and to or be clear, raped. to be clear, these things will happen. These things have always happened. They will yeah. always happen. Mm. There's no so any any conversation about this that tries to like adopt this moral, uh, moralizing tone is a waste of everybody's time because these things will always happen. Mm. Many of us are, are products of uh, are, many of our parents didn't tell us. Mm. <laughs> so let's just be very clear about this. Mm. So. Babies being conceived and born out of wedlock is a thing that has always happened and will continue to happen as long as humanity exists. It will not stop. So the issue then is how do we, how do we protect mm. the women? So how how do you give them access to certain rights yeah. and resources such that they don't end up vulnerable and then you know they end up being poached by these baby yeah. factory operators yeah. Yeah. and yeah. you know yeah. So I, I, I agree with. You. I agree with David. Sorry to to to, to no, jump please in. Do. But I, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with David. I think uh, my point is the fact that um, you know there's a role for government, and I think that uh, that is really where government should come in and take um, some of that responsibility from two sides: um, from providing a safe location, counselling, a platform where uh, people who who have that challenge can go to um, and, and get proper counseling and get proper care. Um, so that, that's one area. Because I think that, you know, um, we treat these people, especially the young women who um, face, are facing this challenge, um, you know, th th there's a failure of, of, in terms of the cultural um, stigma that they face. Yeah. Um, government should not be also... Because uh, you also find it's, it's like going to a police station, like David saying, you, you're a woman, you go to a, st you, you go to a police station to complain that um, some guy molested you. Uh, and then the, the policeman will start asking, ah, but what did you wear? Mm. Or how can you be out later? This, you know, I, and then, you know, almost like victim shaming the person. Mm. Yeah. But I think government should be 
should take a position where um, the role of government is actually becoming a safe haven mm. for people that are vulnerable like that um, and providing them with and of, of, of course the issue of uh, more public advocacy yeah. um, should be should, should come on um, from from you know secondary schools and all yeah. kinds of uh, uh, positions where uh, this sort of things are likely to happen um, to find ways in which uh, uh, we can provide a lot more information mm -hmm. to them. Um, to the young people, um, and not just the, the, the young women, but also the young boys also yeah. in terms of having more education about yeah. being sexually active and sexual health and all, all those kind of things are mm -hmm. uh, important things. Because we people take it, you know, a uh, position that even providing young people with information or education about sexual health um, you, is, uh, is shameful, uh, America, you know. Uh, America, quickly, uh, like yeah. David has said, whether you provide information or not, exactly. these things will happen. Mm. Oh, absolutely. We, we have, we, 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 it, it, quickly, it's, it's I agree. human nature. I agree. We have Minister of Women Affairs. We have Ministry for Youth Development. We have Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. These various departments should collaborate mm. in these sectors to say, it is not enough to say we, 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 we close down a baby factory. You close one, three will spring up mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they are always located in remote areas. They always have people. Mm. You have people who are homeless. Why are they homeless? Mm. And so if government is able to provide social security for somebody and he knows that, look, even if I have a baby, I can get a job. I can have access to a home. I can take care of that baby. Mm -hmm. There will be no need to want to sell the baby to exactly. somebody else. Exactly. But when you look at the circumstances, you don't have a so, home, you don't have a roof so, over so, your head, you don't so have liberous. a... So, Liberus, uh, yeah. sorry to, to, to cut in. Please so, do. Uh, you're, just, you're describing a situation of poverty then. So, yes. it's, it's more of, a, you know, this is the causal thing is poverty. Poverty Not is driving poverty. a lot of people... Not Do just, no, no, I'm talking about solutions. I'm talking about solutions, not just okay. the cost now. Take, mm -hmm. for example, as a young man in the UK, as a young lady, you can uh, apply for a council flat. Mm. And even so that independence, you that can independence have. if you have that independence, there's a limit to how vulnerable you can be. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so there's need for government to begin to look at these areas. How do we ensure that we create, you know, these platforms, mm -hmm. these, um, these cushions, these opportunities, yeah. Yeah. so that you can assess these things, even if your parents reject and refuse to no, let accommodate me, let me you. give some insight because I'm pursuing, uh, I know I did the advocacy, but I'm, I'm pursuing this matter beyond just doing an advocacy. And because I know people who are directly involved, particularly one lady who gets lots of these young ladies and she's just acting like a good Samaritan. One lady was gang raped and yet she had to run away from her family because the family were, you know, she was really afraid of them. But she was saying that even the government bodies, and I don't know if she'll go on record to say this, even the gender affairs, when they get these babies off the motherless babies' homes, they literally sell the babies themselves. So yeah. they're selling them one point something million, they're giving these girls those pittance. Why don't they at least come up front, give the girls enough, she's saying they should at least pay the girls rent for like, you know, maybe six months so the girls can be up on their feet and learn a trade and, and help them. And because if you really want to help them, they know what to do. Ekene, that's because there are no sanctions. You have a commissioner, a minister who comes on board, he's looking for loopholes to an, create avenue to make money. Mm. That's why he or she is in and government. Nobody is overseeing. And so nobody is overseeing him. And then when you complain, you're looking, you're, you, you looked at as, you know, a nobody, no rights. And so, why, who are you to complain? After all, they are doing you a favor by even giving you 200000 for a baby you can't take care of. Yes. You know, they are that arrogant. Yeah. And, and so, if there's responsibility, if the criminal justice system also needs to be effective in this. And I know Lagos State Government has a department for this, but it is not enough to just have a department. If you create special courts where matters such as this are tried timelessly and people are sent to jail for such offenses, yes then we would know that we have started yes, somewhere. That's... Because a situation where you have, you know, all of this, even the government is culpable, government officials are culpable, then there will be no hope yeah. than for these young ladies to sell uh, the, babies. The, the babies. And then the guys also, nobody is talking about but them, yeah, nobody is no holding them responsible. Yeah. You know, a situation where your son impregnates your house help 
and then you send the house help away from home, oh and nobody is taking responsibility. Go, the state, the police also, you know, because you're a rich man, the police comes and then they, they sweep the matter under the carpet. You know, we can't continue like this no, as a can't. society. Just, just quickly finish. Okay, into quickly. That. <laughs> I, I remember, because we're uh, about to round up on this segment. But go yes. ahead. Uh, he also made a point about uh, the fact that sexual education is not just for girls, it's mm. for boys too. Yeah. And I remember reading a few weeks ago an account of a lady who is involved in, with an NGO that does sexual health education for secondary school students. And she said she went into a, into a classroom, I think it was an SS2 classroom, an SS3 classroom. And it was, it was about consent, what they were discussing that day. And she said throughout the 30 minutes that she spoke, she saw discomfort on the faces of the boys in the class. Like real discomfort, they were uncomfortable. That, because they hadn't heard it know, before. Because basically she was trying to explain to the girls in the class mm. that this, they, can, they can say no. Yeah, that, and, and that if you said no and this happened anyway, then you it's were rape. raped. <laughs> in case you didn't know. So, okay, sorry, we have to stop it there. Um, <laughs> we, we're out of time on this segment. To accept responsibility, it helps if others point out to you your blind spots. We rely on your feedback for this. On homework can be smart work, Oladile Dosumu has a lot to say, and he says, it's about time they started trusting their employees. Working from home is becoming the norm. If employers employ the right caliber of people in the first place, then micromanaging like they do in Nigeria will have to stop. When you employ the right people, give them the chance to actually show their abilities, as long as they are, there are checks and balances in place. It's a win-win situation. A lot of Nigerian employers think they have to be smartest in their business, like Steve Jobs said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people to tell us what to do. Please say it some more, Ladile. <laughs> I, like, I like the sound of what you're saying. Foreign versus traditional gods is still gathering momentum amongst you. Emeka, take, take notes. <laughs> Airward Forsen says, we need more of this kind of talk. This is one of the talks we Africans should have. Okay. Also, AW says in capital letters, of course, and your leaders or presidents are the overseers of the colonial master's estates, which you call country. Africa is still a slave colony now, wow, and there is a solution to it. It's a soft power of awareness, love, and unity. Oh, what a way to go, AW. Didn't see that coming. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, David will be charting the course of our democracy. Over to you, David. More democracy or less, the debate that our future hinges on. A debate that has recently captured the Nigerian public's imagination, especially in the light of my Rwandan adventure late last year, is does democracy serve a developing Africa well, or is so-called benevolent dictatorship the way forward for us? Do we do it the Botswana way, or do we do it the Rwanda way? Do we, do we have sustainable progress via consensus, or quick progress via military fiat? I always make the point that post-independence African dictators whether perceived as benevolent or otherwise, all fail to achieve the goals that dictatorship is supposedly optimized for, all of them without an exception. Whether it was Thomas Sankara or Mobutu Seseko, dictatorship really has no spectrum of good to evil because it always results in the same things. And these things are disregard for rule of law, intolerance of political opposition, development of a personality cult, and eventually, inevitably, the dreaded corruption. Now, Mobutu, Idi Amin, and the, uh, Mengistu of Ethiopia might have specialized in open villainhood. villainhood. Everyone knew that these are bad guys. But the thing is, even the supposed, supposed good ones like Thomas Sankara also ended up misusing their power and oppressing people. So in Sankara's case, he favored setting up show trials where the defendants were not allowed legal representation and they were hit with unreasonable punishments, including ludicrously long prison terms and fines. Now, conveniently, his political enemies tended to end up on the wrong side of these things, and that's funny, huh? The regular counterpoint to this is, well, we've had democracy since 1999, and you know, what has it done for us? And to this, I have one clear and simple response, and that is what Nigerians, what we Nigerians have known 
as democracy since 1999 is only democracy in the most general sense of the word. The first civilian president in the Fourth Republic was General Olusegun Obasanjo, well, retired general, if that makes you feel better. The next was the brother of Shehu Yaradua, another prominent military figure. The third was a rank outsider who was quickly booted out when the empire struck back in 2015. And the fourth, well, we all know, we all know him very well, don't we? The actors are almost exclusively derived of the military era, and the apparatus of state is still configured toward military di dictatorship. If you don't get the scale of Nigeria's sheer lack of any kind of democratic tradition, consider that Nigeria only passed a Freedom of Information Act under a non-military affiliated president within the last decade for the first time in its history. In other words, the point I'm making is that the problems Nigerians have with the current political system are the results of dictatorship not democracy. The reaction to the perceived failures of civilian administration to get the results we want to see should not be to hanker after the military jackboots that hamstrung their civilian successors in the first place. I wrote recently about General Mutala Mohammed's unilateral gutting of the civil service in 1976, which effectively destroyed the country's central institution by removing its knowledge bank and instituting a grab all you can ad hoc culture. The results of that boneheaded dictatorial decision still live with us today under what is, at least in name, a civilian administration. So our dissatisfaction with these problems should clearly should not impel us to go back to our proverbial Egypt, craving for a strong man to come and sort everything out in his strong, unilateral, unquestioned, process-free and unaccountable wisdom. I mean, this would seem to be a basic point of logic and common sense from my point of view, but unfortunately it seems as if the penny really has not dropped with a significant number of Nigerians and indeed Africans. In case the point I'm trying to make is not clear enough, I will reiterate in plain English. The solution to the problems associated with democracy as we know it is more democracy. Dictatorship is never the answer, except the question is, do you want to go back in time and die of toxic nostalgia? It is not easy to accept the annoyances and responsibilities that come with democracy, but life is never easy and Africans of all people should know that. I, I, I really appreciate your history lesson because um, some of these people like Sankara, I hadn't actually come across until I, I came across your script. So, but I do know Idi Amin because we watched the horror. There was a movie version. And Idi Amin was a bad guy. Heads in Sankara was also No, but they made a movie about Idi Amin. Heads in, yeah, because actually when I read up Sankara after that, you could see that the guy bothered to set out a vision. Mm -hmm. he, he would write things about women's rights. Mm -hmm. He would write things about how he saw nation. And he actually achieved a few things. But, but so, so the, really, the crux of the matter is the guy derailed, not because he didn't set out with an intention to be a good man, but because, again, no checks and balances, which I, I have to weigh into the same scale as you. Dictatorship cannot work for anybody, whether in the Western world or in Africa or wherever. Once you leave uh, one man without any checks and balances, it's a recipe for disaster. He will eventually abuse it, even if he doesn't do it initially. As time passes, he will abuse it. So you have to respect people like Nelson Mandela for just setting a limit on their own time because they don't want to become toxic, and he, people he around them will not detector. tell them. He operated, Nelson Mandela. Yeah, he wasn't a detector. No, but he, he determined that he wouldn't do second term, and that yeah, was the no, safest no. thing to do. So I think, you know, going back to your wiki, rivers of wickedness, we need to also be aware when we look at people who are operating without checks and balances, whether in our homes or in our uh, uh, offices or wherever, that that is where the danger lies. A bit like Emeka is trying to target incompetence. I will step, take a step behind that and say, where you can put checks can, and balances, mm. put checks and balances. Because, Sorry, uh, uh, em Emeka, mm. please permit me to quickly do uh, this. Uh, in agreeing yeah, with you ahead. completely, if we had allowed democracy, no matter as faulty as it was in the First Republic, as faulty as it was, if we had allowed it to thrive, like you said, the, the, the best way out of the problem of democracy is more democracy. Or the right we, kind of thing. Right, <laughs> no, 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 no. Because if we had allowed it, mm. we probably would have fumbled, wumbled, and stumbled. By now, you will have a system in place that would have grown out of those uh, problems. Mistakes. But at every point, we run back to our proverbia, to use your word, Egypt. Okay. And then we we'll go back, you bring um, a military supposedly military benevolent person who ends up, you know, becoming a dictator. Like uh, Dari, but were we not secretly Dari Babarisa that our present was, president will operate like a dictator and just No, no, make that's it for some for people. Us. That's for some people, not for some of us. Mm. Dari Babarisa once wrote an article, he said, knowing when to die. 
that some of these dictators knew when to die. If Murtala Mohammed had not died when he died, he probably would have been worse than the worst dictator we've ever had. Mm. You talk, talked about the issue of some, some palm sec said they were on their way to work when they had they heard their name on radio sacked. And so that introduced psychophancy, warming up to a federal okay. commissioner. You know, before then, if your... a palm sec could disagree openly with a governor, a federal commissioner, because that wasn't his true. But when he knew that he could be sacked over the radio, he would have to koto. So this was how we gradually destroyed all, all of the institution. And now you begin to look for one Jerry Rollins who will come and right the wrong. Yes. No, we need yeah. to consistently mm -hmm. continue on this trajectory to get it right. Mm -hmm. And if, do you think and if we were in a military detector, you and I would be in this detectorship, you and program I, like no matter how benevolent, you and I do. would be in this, <laughs> this studio discussing? It's impossible. Yeah. And, and so, with all its faults, democracy is still the best the way for to us. Go. And we still need to just to fine -tune trudge it. on and fine-tune it as we go. Uh, I, 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 you know, I completely agree with, with David, with Liberos, with what you guys have said. What of me? You're not um, agreeing with me, Emeka. Yeah. I agree with you as well, uh, but let me say this it's, though. It's not presumed um, though. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me drop a little caveat. And, and, and the point is this, and we've seen it. Uh, democracy um, can also lead to a dictatorship. Right? Let's, let's just get that. We yes, saw what I agree happened with you. In, 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 with you. in Germany um, that led to, the, after the First World War, and with Hitler's the, 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 the rise of the Ted Reich. Um, so it is possible for people to manipulate demo a democratic governance government into a dictatorship. And that can happen. So I think the most important thing is that it's, it's the values of democracy that we need to work okay. a lot more on yeah, um, in, in terms of getting the citizens to participate, to understand that, you know, because again, the other point that before I come back to, to this is that understanding that um, development is one thing because you can also develop as a country um, under a system yeah. of government that is not democratic. So let, let, let's let's also understand that. Yeah, we but saw that because in China, Nigeria. Because China, you know, I, 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 I just want to separate the two because people often say, oh, um, like David said when he started his, his, his advocacy that people will make the, the thing that, look, we, we've operated under democracy since 99. Where has that gotten us? Mm. So that, 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 is, that, is, that, that is, that is, we need to sort of um, um, distinguish two things. Yeah, yeah distinguish them. Um, yes, under democracy, it's a thing about your, your humanity is given a voice. Yeah. Um, you are able to, it, it's not often perfect. Democracy is really, it's, it's, it's how humanity functions. People yeah. have a voice. Yeah. If you, even, even if in, in, in this situation where on a domestic level, you're a parent, you're a father, and you're operating the most autocratic, yes. despotic your own home environment. Yes. Trust me. No, no, no uh, matter how much. But sorry, no matter, Mecca, let me let me come no in very quickly much, because no, I want to you add to, to that. No matter how much development you bring to that home, no matter how much uh, toys or buildings or mm -hmm. you know you bring to that, home, when there is no humanity in that home, yeah. um, it, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah that's what no, I'm right, Yeah, no, and then I just taking from when you said you know democracy is giving a voice to humanity. Um, I feel that we also again back to my theme of taking responsibility. Maybe that's my my lockdown uh, motto. Um, I feel that um, a lot of times when people are comfortable and we have to take responsibility ourselves as the middle class or upper class, however we see ourselves, people seem to be able to just divorce themselves from the pains of others. Yeah. How can we be happy in a country where there's so much illiteracy, there's so much poverty? The voice of others, especially the ones who are disenfranchised, should bother us day and night. And that's why we're, the chickens are coming home to roost. If we're in a country where the majority of the population are not enlightened thinkers, that's, what, that's why a few people are able to oppress the majority. So we should make it our priority, those of us who have access to education, access to whatever it is we have, to, we will not yeah. be happy it, it until it, others it join it. us. So then you have a majority it voice can, can who will I, not stand for the rubbish that's Which is digital. why David is raising this advocacy. You know, it's a voice. Mm. It's a way of educating people. You know the extent, but the we, mileage, this one But we can be passive, those of us no, it's, it's, who have managed to put generator so in our I agree house, with you. jeep in our... I agree, in our, with, I agree you with you. I agree with you. So that's why also Emeka is saying, let's distinguish between what democracy is really about. Yeah. Not about the development, the, not about the building voice of roads. The many. Yeah. It is about humanity. You, yeah. Because you can build these roads, you can put all the best structures in place, and yet the people 
are not free. Uh, yeah. There is no humanity yes, in, in being the, lifted up. Being lifted up. Yeah. So it's about it's all about um, it's about fear. It's yeah. you, you, you know. So we need to really understand what democracy is about. Yeah. And so once we understand it, we can preach the message yeah. of democracy. And not be happy it's that you voice. have your own voice. Yes. What about the others? So uh, I, maybe you yeah. want to the, my yeah. last word that I would just. It doesn't I'll, have to be your last. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just point out that. So people often point to China as the example of a country that developed without democracy and okay. is supposedly doing fantastically well. And I'll also, I, I just want to say that if, if there's a Canadian city called uh, Vancouver, yeah. which, which recently introduced a tax on empty houses because their real estate market was being distorted by wealthy Chinese people coming in and buying up their real estate. Now, there are so many Chinese people coming from China and parking their money in Canada that that city had to enact that legislation. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because no matter how much economic growth is happening in China, no matter how much money they're making, no matter how many roads and high-speed roads they're building, they are not free. Yeah. So, so to escape to they send express. their children to Canada. Their children to become school. Canadian citizens. Yeah. And settle down there. You know, and then the parents are back home. Under in a democratic Shanghai system. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So democracy is is the gold standard of the human condition. Democracy is about asking questions. When your leaders go wrong, you point it to you them that this, you challenge them, yes. You challenge them that this is not the way to go about it. It's about voice, about humanity. Let me, let, let me add that, uh, because some, we mentioned China, we mentioned all of these Western countries, and people tend to think that democracy is Western. But uh, I'm an Igbo man, and, and one of the things of, 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 of being an Igbo person is this is a fundamental democracy that in Igbos that we have. So it's not, it's, I, I want to put it in perspective because it's not, so when people say, um, that's why the Igbos say, uh, Igbo and Weze, the Igbos have yes. no king. I don't the, even think it's limited uh, to the Igbos. I think it's a human No, I'm human just saying, I'm just, I, mean, I mean, I have to use a, a, the yeah, an example you know. that I'm comfortable, mm. that, I, that I understand. Yeah. So that was my first outing on The Advocate and already it feels like home. No wonder it's all about our Commonwealth. Keep your comments coming in on Facebook at Plus TV Africa. Uh, hashtag the advocate ng or on twitter and instagram at plus tv africa and hashtag the advocate ng to catch up with previous broadcasts go to plus tv africa.com forward slash the advocate and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel plus tv africa until next time when the topics will be fresh but familiar let's keep advocating for a better society goodbye bye bye, -bye. Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.